There may be aliens in our Milky Way galaxy, and there are billions of other galaxies. The probability is almost certain that there is life somewhere in space. Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin When looking up at the night sky, we can see millions of celestial bodies and can't help but think how small we humans really are. One might play with the idea that there is other life out there, but maybe far away and out of reach. But what if this extraterrestrial life was closer than we think? There are countless witnesses of UFOs and some of these have even experienced even closer encounters. Tonight, we probe into perhaps the most important of these abduction events on this close encounter of the fourth kind episode of Snipe Hunt. Welcome back to Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. I am your little green host, Darren Young. And I am your host, Gary Gray Clevenstein. Why am I gray? The gray. Gary the gray. Gary the gray. Like the gray alien. Oh. Yeah. Like E.T. Yeah. I got you. I mean. I can't read. <laughs> uh, tonight we are finally covering aliens and UFOs. You're excited. I can feel it. I can feel it coming in the air. <laughs> Specifically, the landmark alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. That's right. We are finally covering aliens in a full episode. It's about time we got to extraterrestrials. I'm super ready for this episode. I got my wisdom tooth pulled out oh, yeah, no, last Thursday, that. so it's been a week. I'm still pretty tender, and my mouth is like both really dry and really wet all at the same time. So if I sound weird when I'm reading. That's why. But you know, everything went well. Did it hurt? Afterwards, like, cause no, one, it, it didn't hurt me at all. one was voluntary. Like, yeah. He said, the dentist said, you don't have to, but I suggest it. And so <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, well, I have insurance. And yeah, might as well. Dude, like three days after, excruciating. Really? Yes. I, every, I was like, why did I have this done? Yeah, I, I didn't need it done. Why did I have it done? What tooth was it? My wisdom tooth. Oh, okay. Like, one of the, yeah. I can't remember which one it was now. The bottom right, I believe. Yeah, I got the top left. And apparently, apparently the tops are a lot easier than the bottoms and you experience a lot of less pain. I didn't feel a thing during the procedure. I was awake and aware the entire time. I got the laughing gas, but other than that, I was awake. And they had to crank that thing up to get me to feel anything. They just kept going, can you feel it now? Are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? I was like, no, no, no. I really didn't. I really didn't. I think I felt it actually during the procedure, but not really any before or after. But everything went well hardly feel any pain the only problem i had a problem the only part i had a problem with was the aftercare it's like oh you can only eat soft foods and oh, i was like right. this sucks yeah, yeah but today is the day where i can go back to normal food i mean i'm still kind of tender so can i might drink just, out of a straw now i can okay. but i drank out of straw last night it didn't feel too great so i'm probably just gonna avoid that for like another week that one's easy i Let's can say avoid give that you like dry whatever they call it whatever that Dry socket. Dry yeah, socket. I know. I looked it up beforehand because I never had a, any of my teeth removed. This is my first wisdom tooth no. that got removed. And I, I freak myself out a little bit, which is weird because I don't freak myself out. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, everything's good. I'm sure our listeners would rather listen to the alien stuff. But I just want to let everyone know my tooth is out. People care about you, man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for all the support in my, in my uh, totally serious and not at all common procedure. All right, so when most people think of folklore, I'm sure that old world superstitions or monster tales come to mind. But the fascination with aliens and UFOs are prime examples of modern contemporary folklore. The other reason I wanted to cover this now is that the 60th anniversary of this foremost abduction is this year on September 19th. And this episode will be released on that very day, this Sunday. So I'll be releasing it on the 60th anniversary to the day. Nice. Right? So it was good that we, ha that we had to reschedule last week. What makes this specific case so special is that it is one of the first of its kind. So what better introductory episode into the subject than with the very first widely reported alien abduction? Now, the key word here is abduction, as in kidnapped unwillingly, because there were people such as alleged contactee George 
Adamski, uh, who claimed to willingly go into alien crafts and fly around and have a grand old time, as opposed to the taken and experimented on narrative that we are used to. And there's also the case of Antonio Vias Boas in Brazil, who claimed to be abducted in 1957, reported in 1958, and was printed in some obscure Brazilian magazine, but it never really gained any real popularity. So at the very least, our subject today is the first widely reported and documented abduction. So a lot of the tropes we associate with alien abductions likely originated from this first encounter. Speaking of tropes, before we get into this, what is the first thing that you think of when you think alien abduction? I picture a round machine yeah. coming over somebody, shooting down the, the, the light. Yeah. Sucking. Like a, like the tractor beam? Yeah, the tractor beam, yeah. And then uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, and then, um, you know, a lot of uh, butt stuff. Oh, yeah. Butt stuff is very prevalent. I think I got that from South Park, though. Especially with the alien. I mean, it's not, they didn't just come up with that out of thin air, so. Right. I played a lot of uh, Destroy All Humans when it first came out. Oh, so yeah. when I think Alien Abduction, I, that's the first thing Let's I think of. video game? Yeah. I haven't played the remake yet. I heard it's... I the I, visuals are a million times better. I don't think I've ever played it. Oh, you, sh you should play the remake. It's really funny, actually. But... I'm sure the people want to know who the hills were. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm gonna, Do you want to find out? Yeah, I want to find out. Let's find yeah. out. Because, you know, this whole episode is named after them. Tell us. So, Betty out of Betty and Barney Hill, was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire, and Barney was a U.S. postal worker and an Army veteran. They were both divorcees with children from the previous marriages. They met in the summer of 1956 and married in May of 1960 and lived together in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. In the summer of 56. <laughs> they were actually an unusual pair for this time period in America as they were an interracial couple. Uh, Betty was white and Barney was black. During this time of growing racial tension in the United States, this power couple were active members of the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and Barney sat on the local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Both were educated, charismatic, and well-respected members of their community. Uh, what I'm getting at is that they were both normal, credible, discerning people with pristine reputations and were not ones to fabricate fanciful tales or even ones to indulge in shenanigans. Okay, that's speculation. Maybe they did partake in the occasional shenanigan, but who hasn't? I know Gary has. So, in September of 1961, Betty had a full week off of work, and so Barney decided to join her and took a couple days off work himself. He surprised Betty with this move, and the couple decided to take an impromptu trip to Niagara Falls and to Montreal, Canada. Little did they know that this trip would expose them to terror of the most extreme and change their lives forever. 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 And ever. And ever. <laughs> <laughs> they headed out on Sunday, September 17th with trip funds of $70. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but that would be about $600 in today's money, so pretty good. Their car was packed with provisions for the road trip as well as luggage. Barney decided to bring a pistol along with protection in case they decided to sleep in their car along the trip. Wait, did he bring a pistol along for protection or did he bring along a pistol and protection? We, <laughs> I, think that's what, I, I, think I don't that, know. I think you said Probably both. <laughs> He's packing heat either way. <laughs> And last but not least, the couple brought along their beloved weenie dog, Delcy. I think it was a weenie dog. I didn't double check that. <laughs> <laughs> their small dog, Delcy. They traveled to Niagara Falls, visited Toronto, made their way to the Thousand Islands area, and finally to Montreal. I wonder if that's where the dressing comes from. <laughs> Maybe, actually. It's, I always thought of it was more of a tropical-ish themed dressing, but yeah, it could come from... Tune like, in next time! <laughs> yeah. Not going to double check that. Not right now. In Montreal, the couple got lost quite a few times and had a difficult time finding a motel that would accept their dog. This combined with the news that Tropical Storm Esther was gearing up to hit the East Coast and their town in New Hampshire, the couple decided to cut the trip short and head back home early to avoid driving back in the oncoming storm. And here's where we get to the interesting part. On the evening of September 19th, 1961, the hills were back in New Hampshire driving through the scenic and remote White Mountains area in their 1957 Chevy. 
Barney was in the driver's seat navigating south down the state's major route towards U.S. Interstate 93. It was a warm, clear night. The stars were out at their brightest as the couple drove through the familiar scenic area. Suddenly, Betty's attention was caught by a light moving in the night sky. She looked up to see what she thought was a shooting star, and then the light stopped. Betty now thought she might be witnessing a satellite in the night sky, but then it changed its route and started heading in the direction of the moon. Wait a minute, back in the, the 50s? Yeah, we had satellites. I know that, but I mean, like, did did we as people know about satellites? So, Betty actually, uh, she was a little bit into astronomy. Yeah. And as we'll find out, they live close to the Air Force Base. Oh, I got you. Um, so, she, she was like almost an amateur astronomer, but not really. She just kind of like dabbled in it. But I didn't figure that would be pertinent, so I didn't include it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I'm glad you're asking questions. This strange light intrigued Betty greatly and had Barney pull over so they could both witness this light. Barney, the pragmatic one of the couple, told Betty it was likely just a plane, but as he looked at the light through binoculars, he also thought this craft had a strange and erratic flight pattern. The couple continued to drive down Route 3, and the zipping light seemed to follow them. It changed directions rapidly. Up down left right up down left right b a that's what i was saying <laughs> a, a b start <laughs> and at times it would hover still before resuming its unpredictable movement as they came to a slight curve they finally clearly saw the source of the light directly above the road in front of them was a flat circular disc a classic flying saucer hovering about 100 feet above the ground Barney brought the car to a stop in the middle of the road and grabbed his binoculars to get a better look at this craft. The craft suddenly shifted course and hovered above the trees on one side of the road. Barney grabbed the pistol and got out of the vehicle to investigate. Gonna shoot some aliens. That's the first thing I think of when I see a a big unidentified flying object is, oh, I'm gonna shoot at it. Yeah, I'm gonna go after it and I'm gonna bring my gun with me. (laughs) The dubious disc was huge about 80 feet in diameter and sported two rows of windows across the rim. As Barney approached, the fins equipped with a red light extended out on either side of the craft. He looked through his binoculars and saw the craft's occupants, figures in black uniforms darting about. Among them was the evil-faced leader. Barney described the leader as a smallish man dressed in a military-style black hat and black glossy jacket with a scarf hanging over his shoulder. The drip is real. This being reminded Barney of the Nazi officers of World War II. The leader stared at Barney with large, haunting, slanted eyes which almost wrapped around his large head and communicated a message to Barney telepathically. Don't do German accent. <laughs> <laughs> Nine. Stay there. Keep looking. Stay there and keep looking. Stay there and keep looking. That was good. Thank you. Perfect, yeah. Thank you. Barney then felt like prey in the eyes of a predator and feared that he was about to be plucked out of the field, so he raced back to his car. And with what breath he could muster, told Betty they needed to leave now or they would be captured. Barney gunned the car down the road and the saucer gave chase. It hovered directly above their vehicle and the couple suddenly heard rhythmic buzzing sounds and it caused the car to vibrate. The sound seemed to bounce off the trunk of their car. At this point, the couple's senses began to dull and it was almost like experiencing an altered state of consciousness. They felt a strange tingling throughout their bodies. Then, a second series of buzzing sounds startled the couple awake. They had vague memories of some sort of roadblock and a large fiery red orb that descended toward the ground. They were surprised to find that they were 35 miles away from where they were when they stopped their car, with no memory of how they got so far. They were once again surprised when the sun began to rise and they arrived home at 5 a.m., hours later than it should have taken them. Hmm. So here's our initial experience. They see the UFO, they run away from the UFO, the UFO gives chase, they hear buzzing sounds, twice they kind of go into like this altered state of loopiness and then when they wake up they're 35 miles away with no memory of how they got there and they experience the classic trope 
lost time. So they're two hours ahead of what they should be, and they have no idea what's been happening for this two hours. I feel like we're sitting at a table read for Men in Black. Yep, yep. Actually, well, Men in Black are a quote-unquote real thing. In, mm -hmm. Well, they are a real thing in folklore, and that's what the movie is based off. Here come Men in Black. <laughs> a lot of music today. Betty would later write about this encounter. How later? I wonder how later this is. I think she wrote it like later that well, day. Trying to oh okay yeah. I was trying to decide. We entered our home, <laughs> turned on the lights. Okay, we entered our home, turned on the lights, and went over to the window and looked skyward. We stood there for several minutes. Then Barney said, "This is the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me." We both wondered if they would come back. We felt very calm, peaceful, and relaxed. We sat at the kitchen table, looked at each other, shook our heads in puzzlement, and asked each other, Do you believe what happened? We agreed it was unbelievable, but it had really happened. After they had slept, Betty and Barney went into separate rooms and drew what they saw. Their drawings of the craft was extremely similar. They quickly lost their sense of calmness, and in place of it, uneasiness set in, especially for Barney. I'm a little confused by that. By what? Because they, they, I don't know, just their their reaction. Exactly. Like, uh, mm -hmm. obviously they both were there. Yep. And they both saw it. Yep. But I guess if she was asking, do you believe what happened? I guess it's kind of like. Right. It's like, dude, can yeah, you believe that? Can you believe that? Yeah. yeah okay. Exactly. All right. Sorry. Yeah. But it is strange that they're like so calm and peaceful about it. But then as the day go along or even as the days go along. They're getting more and more uneasy about what they experience. Right. Almost like it was like an artificial calmness. Betty went out to their car the next day and noticed there were many silvery spots on the trunk of the car. Putting a compass over the spots caused the needle to spin wildly. Watching the compass spin filled Betty with an inexplicable terror. She was still curious, but at this moment it took all she had just to keep calm. Betty kept the luggage packed and kept them on the backside of the house read they might be radioactive. In the coming days, they noticed other curiosities. Their watches had stopped working. The pants Barney wore that night were covered in plant debris and the tops of his shoes were scuffed and scratched. The thick leather strap on the binoculars was snapped in two and Betty's blue dress, it was torn. It was torn. We have a picture of it right there. The actual dress she was wearing on that fateful night. Hmm. Yeah, they're keeping it at some at some university in Connecticut. Yeah, they have like a whole bunch of documentation on it now, on it over there. That's wild. Right? The Hills phoned the nearby Peace Air Force Base in Newington, New Hampshire, and reported their encounter with the aircraft. Barney left out the part about the figures he saw in the craft and how they seemed to telepathically communicate with him. Not long after their initial report... The Hills received a call from Major Paul W. Henderson, who seemed extremely interested in their encounter. The Major expressed no disbelief throughout the call. In fact, he didn't even seem surprised at this strange experience. Hmm, suspicious mm. that the guy from the Air Force Base isn't surprised about their strange encounter mm. with an unidentified flying object. Could it be Area 51? The Major wanted the Hills to relay their story once again to another person. They agreed and talked to this other person, though the Hills did not know to whom they were now relaying their experience. Major Henderson recorded their report in Project Blue Book, a systematic study of unidentified flying objects conducted by the Air Force from 1952 to 1969. Now, if you uh, remember in Episode 8... Interdimensional Bigfoot, we actually read a full Project Blue Book report when we were discussing about how Bigfoot might be an alien. Hmm. Call back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know how you remember it. Okay. Anyways. Because I write this stuff. You do write it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you absorb it. Betty became increasingly interested about what they had experienced that night and checked out books about UFOs from the local library. She had also begun to experience terrible nightmares about the event. In these nightmares, the couple were captured and taken aboard the craft. Although she had no conscious memory of these events, the nightmares seemed to take place between the buzzing sounds during their altered state of consciousness. She began to suspect that these nightmares were actually memories, but told no one at this point. 
So going back to Betty being interested in astronomy, the reason why is because her cousin, I think, actually did see a UFO. And so Betty kind of got into it. And that's how she knew more about astronomy and satellites and all that stuff. I don't know. This whole thing's hairy to me. Right no, now. no. There's so many details yeah. in this story. I had to cut so much of it out because it was just bogging the whole thing down. Well, I'm you're going to post this on social media, I'm sure. But that yep. dress, that, that looks highly suspect <laughs> <laughs> right anyway so i don't think you can see it but i think it's like there it's like torn at the shoulder to at the right shoulder but we'll get into that right all right betty wrote a letter to the author of one of the ufo books she checked out from the library and was responded to by walter webb a boston astronomer and member of nicap the national investigations committee on aerial phenomena who wished to interview the couple or nicap Nightcap. I like yeah. that. Bit. That sounds better. Yeah, it sounds really good. The couple relayed their experience to Webb and explained that they both seemed to remember more about the encounter, but there seemed to be some sort of mental block. Barney suspected that he might have some memories that he did not want to remember. Webb, after analyzing the detail of their stories, determined that they were telling the truth. After this, the Hills returned to their locked home one day to find a pile of brown leaves sitting on their kitchen table. In these leaves, the couple found two blue earrings. The same earrings Betty wore on that fateful night that had been missing until now. <gasps> they have returned. Oh. The Hills knew that someone had entered their home without their knowledge and felt concerned and their sense of safety was gone. I mean, understandable. Mm -hmm. That's like that's like one of my big fears. I've actually had nightmares about it. It's just like someone just breaking into my house. Right. That's, yeah. that's why I won't sleep naked. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, you should sleep naked. It's so comfortable. And I'm like, no, that's, that sounds terrible. I'm like, yeah, right. That's the last thing I want to yeah. do is fight off an intruder naked. Right. Yeah. Luckily I have my gun. So yeah. Well, still, can you imagine picking it up naked? You know, <laughs> less of a man you would feel. At that I, I don't know. That might be even more terrifying for the intruder. <laughs> naked guy with a gun. Two guns. <laughs> <laughs> Both pointed at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The Hills started to conduct their own investigation and met with people of all backgrounds. Air Force officers, ministers, psychi psychiatrists, psychiatrists. Yeah, I know. <laughs> psychiatrists, engineers, and relayed their story to each of them, hoping they could provide some insight and any answers to their experience. Though all were interested, all they could do was speculate. So they're really you know, taking their own personal investigation. They're still like, we're, we're going to find out what the hell happened to us that night. So they're just talking to everyone about it. And so, I mean, there's a whole long thing you can like read about if you're interested in this part, but I just kind of smoothed over this section. Cause like I said, so too obviously many details. in the fifties and sixties, people were interested in this type of stuff. But now if you said this stuff, you'd be looked at like a, right, right. I, I, I think it's part of, Partly because they lived right by the Peace Air, Sword, Air Force Base. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So I think that might have played into it. But other than that, it's it's just a really interesting encounter. And now in these times, it's show me a picture or a video or it didn't. Right, happen. right. And back in those days, I mean, the first real UFO in the United States wasn't until like Roswell in 1947. So at this point, it's still relatively novel. It's still like an almost very new thing. As opposed to now where everyone and their mom has seen a UFO and right. has some sort of experience. Barney's health was declining rapidly. He was pulled between work and family, suffered from severe stomach ulcers, and was noticeably affected by the UFO incident. Though Barney could not remember, others would notice that the left side of Barney's face would twitch rapidly whenever he spoke of the incident. It was at this point that they decided they needed to remember what happened. The Hills got in contact with Dr. Benjamin Simon, a psychiatrist who specialized in hypnotic therapy to treat PTSD, called shell shock at the time. Now keep in mind that before this point, hypnosis wasn't really used to recover memories, and this was decades before the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s, which showed how hypnosis could implant false memories. Although Betty and Barney wanted to remember, Dr. Simon's intent was to use the hypnosis to help treat their anxiety, not help them remember. Uh, Dr. Simon was a firm skeptic on the existence of UFOs and told the Hills that hypnosis isn't a magical cure, but it could help with their symptoms. But it couldn't help his bowel. Sorry. All right. We're not to that part yet. No, I know. I'm just, no, I just automatically, I can already see where this is going. Oh, yeah, for sure. 
and so began the hypnotic therapy. Dr. Simon trained with the Hills for several months in order to put them into a hypnotic state. Then it was finally time for them to begin hypnotic regression. Barney was able to provide more details about that fateful night, and upon describing the craft following them, Barney would start to scream and panic until Simon calmed him down and assured him that memories could not hurt him. And thus the Hills began to remember the abduction. Barney and Betty separately recounted the story to Dr. Simon about the light in the sky, the face-off between Barney and the saucer, the pursuit, the buzzing, their fading consciousness, their awakening with memories of the last few hours gone, and finding themselves miles away from their previous destination. Then the void of missing time began to fill with memories. During a session, Barney stated, I made a turn and I never knew this. I don't know why I had to make that turn and I was lost. I saw I was on a strange area of the highway and I had never been there before and I was being stopped. I was very uncomfortable, but somehow the eyes were telling me that I should be calm and that I would not be harmed and to relax. And I saw these men coming down towards me. Betty continued the story in a separate session. She remembered stopping due to several men in the road. Then the car died and would not start despite Barney's attempts. Betty became terrified and began to sob uncontrollably. A group of six small men opened their car doors and despite their fear, Barney and Betty could neither run nor fight back. These men were about five feet tall in grayish blue uniforms. They had gray skin, bluish lips, extremely dark hair, and pitch black eyes. Barney felt two eyes close to his and pushed into his eyes. During the hypnotic sessions, he screamed, The eyes! They're inside me! <laughs> the couple remained in their trance and felt themselves losing consciousness. Barney passed out, but Betty fought to remain alert as the men dragged them to a large metallic disc resting on the ground in a clearing in the woods. They were each dragged into the craft into a room with bluish light. They were then escorted into separate rooms which seemed bare other than a long, bare metallic table in the center. Barney was led to and laid on the examining table. He felt like his shoes were removed and his clothes were opened. They turned him over and he felt cold fingers run down his spinal column, almost like they were counting his vertebrae. He felt something narrow press into the base of his spine and could hear a rapid humming sound. He was then turned over and his mouth was examined. They also examined his ears and seemed particularly fascinated with his bone structure. Barney then felt a cup-like device placed to his genitals and he felt a tug or a pressure. Ooh. Although there was no erection or ejaculation, Barney suspected they were taking a sperm sample and suspected that some sort of sample was taken from every orifice of his body. So yeah, a little, little rapey aliens here now. Barney would later find a circular growth of warts on his genitals in the exact spot the cup device was placed. Oh damn it, not again. No, Betty, I swear, it's the aliens. <laughs> The tapes of the hypnosis session seem to indicate that Dr. Simon, for some reason, examined the wards, even though he has no credentials to do so, <laughs> and concluded they were uh, a coincidence and were caused by venereal disease rather than an alien device. But Barney disputed this, his hypothesis. No, Barney, I didn't sleep with Dr. Simon. <laughs> I don't know why we're giving him a southern accent. He's from New Hampshire. That's, it's just so easy to do because yeah, we're Arkansans. Yeah. It was during these sessions that the warts would become inflamed and then eventually had to be removed surgically. The doctor performing the surgery did not think that these were venereal warts as they apparently didn't have the right cauliflower shape. I did not look up to confirm. <laughs> <laughs> Betty was also led to an examination room where she was placed in a chair. They brought out some sort of machine with lenses and put it up to Betty's arm. Betty got the impression that this was some sort of microscope device and they were taking pictures of her skin. They then scraped a skin sample off her arm and placed the specimens in what looked like a piece of cellophane. The extraterrestrial examiner then inspected Betty's eyes, ears, mouth, and teeth. They took a swab of her ears and a specimen of her hair and fingernails. 
Betty could not understand the humming communication of her captures, and so she was surprised to hear English from one of the beings. After the initial exam, the examiner told Betty that they wished to perform a few more tests. He removed Betty's dress, ripping it partially in the process, and led her to an examination table. No, I swear, Barney, she's aliens. <laughs> if she gets warts, I'm done. <laughs> the examiner then produced a device with a cluster of needles. The needle cluster was pressed to her spine, head, arms, and legs, but Betty felt no pain. The examiner then told Betty they would perform a pregnancy test and would cause no pain. They inserted a long six-inch needle into her navel with a sudden thrust. Betty twisted and screamed in pain, which seemed as a surprise and startled the group of men around her. In response, the leader simply waved his hand over Betty's eyes, and the pain was suddenly completely gone. After the examination, Betty found herself alone with the English-speaking leader. She felt comfortable around him as he alleviated her pain and decided to talk to him. She told him that no one would ever believe this experience, and in response, the leader suggested that she should take something from the room as proof. Betty looked around and found a large plastic-like book with symbols written in narrow columns. It was unlike any sort of book that Betty had seen before. What about this? Oh, don't touch that. that no, not that. that. I know she yeah. said you could have anything, but there, there are limits, you know. That one gave your husband more. <laughs> I'm within reason. Yeah, don't touch that. You, you, trust me, you don't want to touch that. <laughs> Later, she would unfortunately have the book taken back by one of the crew members of the craft. They're like, hey, you can't have that. Yeah. Yoink. Betty finally asked the leader where they were from. The leader pulled a map out of the wall and asked Betty if she's ever seen a map like it before. The map consisted of a spattering of dots, which varied in size, and curved lines connected the various dots across the map. When Betty asked where on this map his home was, the leader responded by asking Betty, Where are you on this map? When Betty said she didn't know, the leader responded, If you don't know where you are, there wouldn't be any point in me telling you where I am. Th that, I mean, that's fair. I mean, she has no frame of reference. <laughs> <laughs> and he closed the map. Betty would later sketch this map from memory. Other men then entered the room, carrying Barney's dentures in hand. Betty thought this was comical, as Barney was self-conscious about his dentures and simply thought, Oh, Barney is going to be angry about this. <laughs> the men then tried to pull on Betty's teeth and were confused that her teeth would not come out like Barney's. So then Betty explained to the leader what dentures were and explained that Barney had them due to her previous mouth injury. What a surreal picture. 1960s New Hampshire woman explaining to aliens what dentures are on an autocraft. <laughs> She also explained that some people needed dentures when they are old, but the leader indicated that he had no understanding of aging. After their examinations, the Hills were then escorted back to their car. Once in their seats, the Hills, the Hills saw the craft become a huge burning orb which took off and disappeared into the darkness. Still in their altered state, the couple started the car and began driving. It was during this drive that the hills heard the buzzing again and felt their car vibrate, which brought them back to full consciousness. A lot of this, like I said, a lot of the tropes that we gather from alien abductions come from this story. So we, they get taken aboard the craft in some sort of altered state of consciousness. They each had a medical examination, some tests more invasive than others. One of them got warts that may or may not be <laughs> an STD of some sort. Um, that's why the dress was torn was because the examiner was trying to get it off. Yeah, but he just happened to rip out like an Iron Man type. Well, I think he read that part, but like I said, he all, I think the shoulder of it was also ripped as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like, so he, Betty had to show him where the zipper was, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and they were bo definitely both faithful to each other the whole time. Yeah. This wasn't some weird swapper meet, or maybe it was, <laughs> or swinger meet. That's what it was. The Hills would later describe the beans on board the craft. Their most notable feature was the eyes. They were long, slanted, and extended around the sides of their face. The eyes were mostly black, but a yellowish-white color could be seen around the black pupils, and they did not blink. They had large heads with wide cheeks and a weak chin. They had no ears, no hair, and aluminum gray skin. So your typical... Gray alien. Yep, yeah. yep, exactly. 
They supported their large chested body with spindly legs, and the hills noted that they seemed to have trouble walking when outside their craft. So instead of sea legs, they had earth legs. Yeah. It should be pointed out that this description is similar to aliens portrayed in an episode of the show The Outer Limits, which aired two weeks before the first hypnosis sessions, and may have influenced the Hill's memory. So I actually didn't include a picture of The Outer Limits alien on my little slideshow here, but you can see on this slide, this is Barney's sketch of one of the aliens, or at least the head. So it's got the big slanted eyes. It's probably the most notable feature. I'm not sure what's going on on top of the head. They never really explained that. And it was never really in any of the descriptions. It's a toupee. Oh, no, that's the hat. That's the hat that the, that the leader was wearing. Yeah. yeah. The Nazi leader guy. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. But yeah, you can see the head shape, especially is very typical. Gray. What year did the Grinch come out? (laughs) This looks very, this this looks nothing like the Grinch. That is like the beginning. Hold on. Let me, let me look it up. Dr. Seuss Grinch release date. 1957. So there you Uh go. There you go. Four years before this event. I don't think it looks grungy, but judge for yourself. But uh, the Outer Limits alien, it looks somewhat similar, but not really. There's a lot more because the the Outer Limits alien had like a weird thing going around around mouth. They didn't really describe that. And like we've been saying, their description is very similar to the Greys, which are an alien race, one of many. And, but these are the ones that are most involved in alien encounters, especially alien abductions. When the hypnotherapy sessions finally concluded, Dr. Simon released the tapes to the couple. The Hills then invited Air Force officer Captain Ben Sweat to listen to the first tape with them, as they did not want to listen alone. After the first tape, Captain Sweat listened to the tapes individually on his own, making various notes and even going back to previous tapes to cross-reference his notes. He would later say... What they recalled under hypnosis consistently supported the hypothesis that their experience was real. But Dr. Simon did not believe in UFOs and was not about to. He kept leading them toward any other explanation. The fact that he did not believe them greatly increased their credibility and thus supported the hypothesis that what they remembered was real. Yeah, so a big thing, obviously, with hypnosis, uh, memory regression therapy is, you know, you can implant false memories if you suggest the right stuff. What he's saying here is that Dr. Simon wasn't giving, wasn't leading them on, was trying to lead them away from aliens and UFOs, but they kept coming back to it. During these sessions, Barney seemed consistently terrified when remembering the trauma throughout these sessions and often had to be calmed down by Dr. Simon. Betty, on the other hand, seemed to shift from scared and sobbing at one moment to calm and peaceful the next, even when talking about the same incident. So Barney was like thoroughly full PTSD, terrified of his whole encounter. Betty would flip flop between, oh, it was so wonderful to, oh, it was so terrible. So weird, weird reactions for sure. After these sessions, the Hills went back to their regular lives. Although they did discuss their experience with family, friends, and various professionals for their own private investigations, they did not seek out any public attention. But, in 1965, their story was published in the Boston Traveler when reporter John Luttrell obtained leaked tapes and notes of the hypnosis sessions and the story was reprinted in the United Press International, which gained the Hill's international attention. In 1966, author John G. Fuller worked with the Hills and published the book the Interrupted Journey, which recounted their experience, included Betty's sketch of the star map. Barney would then soon die of a cerebral hemorrhage in 1969 at only 46 years of age. Betty never married again and became somewhat of a celebrity within the UFO community before she too would pass in 2004 at the age of 85. Hmm. So I watched like a couple little short shows where they mentioned Betty and Barney Hill and they showed this one interview with Betty that showed it was from 2011. I was like, mm, I don't think it was from 2011. She, I'm pretty sure she died well before that. Did they seem like cuckoos? No, no. I When I watched a couple of interviews with Betty, she seemed a little out there, Yeah, but that's, you know, that's fair considering you it were. It just makes me wonder if that's why you don't hear of alien abductions anymore is because they got all the info they needed from these two. Maybe, or maybe because whenever people report alien abductions now, everyone just dismisses them as wackadoodles. That's true. So, uh, fun fact, their whole experience was adapted into a 1975 TV movie called The UFO Incident, where Barney was portrayed by the award-winning actor James Earl Jones. 
Ah, which is why I suggested that ah, voice. That's why I suggested it. Here's a, our, our tradition of the aliens, by the way. Oh. Yeah, a more quote unquote accurate version. But what, what makes them really different from the greys is the eyes are less round and more slanted. They wrap around their heads and they're yellowish. But other than that, I like that. Betty's sketch of the star map was analyzed by several people, including amateur astronomer Marjorie Fish and professional astronomers. Uh, Walter Webb, Carl Sagan, and astrophysicist Steven Soder. I've heard of Carl Sagan for some reason. Uh, Fish and Webb pointed out that the map lined up with real star systems if viewed from the perspective of the double star system Zeta Reticuli. But Sagan and Soder believed it was a random alignment of chance points, but did not refute that it did seemingly line up. So if you're in the star system Zeta Reticuli and you look at this map, if you're viewing it from that perspective, it does line up with various celestial bodies, which Betty would have no idea about Zeta Reticuli at this point. I mean, it was discovered, but it wasn't really super well known. And she wasn't like that in astronomy. So it's really interesting that she drew this thing from memory. And it's like, oh, yeah, it happens to line up almost perfectly. Uh, this would indicate that the aliens that the Hills encountered came from the Zeta Reticuli star system, but it should be noted that there are no known planets in this system. Due to the star map and the aliens' description nearly matching those as we know of as the Greys, Grey aliens are sometimes referred to as Zeta Reticulans. All right, so what exactly happened? What we know for sure is that the Hills at least believed wholeheartedly that they were abducted. Barney's logical mind didn't seem to want to believe at first, but he too eventually landed on that conclusion. Now let's go over some alternative theories that try to explain the Hill experience logically. All right, so our first theory is the dream theory. Betty suffered from nightmares immediately following the encounter. Some of these nightmares were unrelated, but a majority of them were about UFOs and about being abducted. This theory states that while the couple did see some kind of unidentified flying object, the abduction narrative came from Betty's dreams, and that Barney's account was influenced by these dreams to the point that they both created false memories of this close encounter. I would say it would be a little bit more believable if it was two separate people from... Right, right. Yeah. I mean, they were taken... They did have two separate experiences because they were taken in different rooms, but right. I, see, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Although Betty already believed in UFOs before this, Barney was extremely skeptical of the phenomenon and did not believe until long after his abduction. So it would be very unlikely that Barney would be influenced by any of his wife's dreams. But of the logical explanations, a shared delusion is probably the most likely. I mean, it's possible. It's happened before. It'll happen well, he's again. not going to say, honey, you're, you're kooky. Oh, <laughs> well, he actually did say that, uh, like, on the way back. She was like, I can't believe we saw a UFO. And she, he was immediately like, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> so <laughs> the next theory is the false memory implantation theory. This theory states that the, while the hills were hypnotized, Dr. Simon suggested alien abduction to the couple, and the vulnerable patients concocted false memories based around this. What discredits this hypothesis is that the hypnosis sessions are all on tape, and a good portion is in print, most notably in the book The Interrupted Journey by John G. Fuller. Uh, it is through these that we can clearly see that at no point does Simon suggest anything of the sort, and even tries to steer the couple away from the aliens for a more logical explanation. Another theory is that the UFO that the Hill saw that night was an experimental craft from the nearby Peace Airport Base. Air Force Base, not Airport Base. <laughs> Close enough. The issue is that Peace never flew experimental craft, at least not officially, and this would not explain the abduction event that followed, at least not without going down a severely consp consp conspiratorial rabbit hole. Hey. Yeah, you did it. Hey. But yeah, this is kind of like what you said earlier, the more Area 51 explanation where there were experimental craft. And even at one point, I think Barney was under the impression when he saw the craft uh, that it was some sort of experimental craft and that these people were humans and they were coming after him or just trying to haze him simply because uh, they were an interracial couple. And so around that time, a lot of interracial couple would get harassed mm -hmm. by other people. So he thought it might have been like uh, younger cadets. Uh, just going out and har harassing him, I guess. I don't know how he came to that conclusion because the more I talk about it, the less likely it seems to how they would single him out 
and uh, follow their car and all that stuff. But you know, you when you're in that situation, you're looking for any sort of actual logical explanation as opposed to, you don't just immediately jump to, I mean, maybe you would now since it's so entrenched in pop culture to aliens, but at the time it definitely wasn't. Well, and I'm sure if something like this actually happened, your frame of mind would not be like, I've, I've never understood, oh, yeah. you know, you hear people being kidnapped and such. And, and if they're luckily found, some of them are found because they could recant what they've seen. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, and, and which, right. Like you said, in the moment, it's really hard. My brain doesn't function that. Like right. I would not, I have a hard time focusing now. So under <laughs> uh, you know some sort of situation like this, I would not under some so encountering something that's super strange. You're under a lot of stress. You're yeah. super scared. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going to happen. Whole lot of thoughts are flowing around in your head. All right. So I mean, it's totally understandable. You're just shocked by the whole thing. Yeah. And of course, the last and most pedestrian theory being that the uh, the whole thing is just a bunch of crock, bunch of bunch of smoke, bunch of baloney, baloney, bunch of hoopla, <laughs> bunch of huckus. Yeah. But I mean, Tuh. one, that's the most boring explanation. Right. And two, the Hills didn't seek out any public attention for this. It, the only reason they got public attention for this is because some reporter got a hold of some of the tapes well, and then leaked it to the public. That's honestly what made me start thinking maybe in a bunch of caca poo poo. Right, right. I, I mean, like, okay, if they didn't immediately go to the press with it, okay. Right, we can't say for sure that this whole thing actually happened, but what we can say for sure is that the Hills definitely believed that it happened. And they didn't want to draw attention. And they didn't want to, especially not Barney, because they uh, Barney worked really hard as a black man in the 1960s. He worked really hard to get this reputation for himself, that he worked really hard to get to a point where he was well respected by his white neighbors. And so something like this, that might just shatter the whole right. thing. It might, he would lose all credibility with his peers. And then, you know, so he, he of all people would want to keep this under wraps. But Betty really wanted to talk about it, so he kind of went along with that because, you know, he's a good husband and all. And that's pretty much it to the hills. Um, like I said earlier, there are far, far more details than what I included. It's an extremely documented case. And if I, and if I covered every single detail, it would probably have to be a 10-part series of tediousness. If the full investigation interests you, I highly recommend the books, The Interrupted Journey by John G. Fuller, of course, and Captured. The Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience by Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin. But I, I, I definitely got the most important stuff in this episode. I'm sure you could just type Barney, Barney and Betty Hill. Oh, there's on YouTube so much, and go dude. Down a wicked rabbit there hole. There's so much. They because they documented even the most minute detail. It's like, what route were you driving down? Were you going right or left? How were you feeling that night? <laughs> so it's it's a whole it's a whole thing. Um, so there is one more thing I wanted to talk about. Um, there is a part of Barney Hill's alien examination that I left out, so let's cover that now in his own words. I could feel them turning me over and putting something in my rectum. It was like a tube. It was not painful. I thought it was just a little larger than a pencil. I felt it go in very easily, and then it was withdrawn. So, like I said, um, he believed that they took a sample from every orifice of his body. Yeah, there's only so many ways into your body. And yeah, absolutely. And that's, anus that's is one of them. One of the easier. So, as promised, let's see if we can get to the bottom of things and answer the question, what's with all the anal probing? So, as we, uh, we all well know, otherworldly proctology is one of the main tropes associated with deductions yep. known by alien enthusiasts and the general population alike. But why? Medical procedures have been associated with abductions since the very beginning. Anal probing seems to be part of that medical procedure, and this particular test is the thing that has captured the obsession of the public. So why do aliens do this? Here are some possible reasons, according to Perihelion Online Magazine. Some very tongue-in-cheek reasons, I should add. Um, one reason is because these aliens are possibly from Uranus. Aha! For s*** and giggles. Aha! <laughs> uh, they're looking for smuggled drugs. To get to the bottom of things. Aha! My son would love this. They like traveling in black holes. <laughs> they like fishing for brown trout. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're 12. Yeah. We had to cover this part. We had to. We had to discuss this. So here we are. Uh, now, all jokes aside, 
One of the reasons why probing is so entrenched in alien folklore is because people associate it with a sexual experience and simply find it funny. Whenever the media picks up an alien abduction story, they usually include a tongue-in-cheek reference to anal probing, such as the case of journalist George Knapp. When he broke the story of his own abduction experiences, many newspapers made probing jokes despite that not being part of his experience. One newspaper even appointed George the High Priest of Cosmic Proctology. Okay, I, I feel sorry for George because he was like, I didn't even get anal probe. And they're like, haha, anal probe, anal probe. But the High Priest of Cosmic Proctology is it's pretty hilarious. Oh, you know, that, remi <laughs> that reminds me. I got like a, a phone call earlier. Yeah. And uh, I didn't recognize the number, but I answered it. And it turns out it was your proctologist. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Zeta Reticula. No, the, the proctologist called me for some reason. Mm -hmm. I get they were trying to call Susan, I guess. But uh, good news. They found your head. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> that was a lot of setup with not a lot of payoff. Well, because I had to answer the question, <laughs> why am I getting a phone call for you? <laughs> Because, so I make, because my head was in. So the the, I get the joke is just, yeah. hey, your proctologist called. <laughs> they found your head. <laughs> All right. Now let's get serious for a minute. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, but another reason why probing has been the most well-known of the medical procedures is because of how invasive and even violating it is. Barney Hill didn't seem too shaken by his probing experience, but definitely suffered from PTSD due to the abduction as a whole, and the probing most likely factored into that. Well, and I can explain, because they, he even said it was like no bigger than a pencil. Yeah. See, what, what, what we've been told over the years growing up is that it's some sort of like... Giant. Giant. Rounded. Double, yeah, exactly. With like all kinds of weird right. instruments coming <laughs> off of it. But no, in actual like UFO lore, uh, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but it definitely seems to be relatively thin. Yeah. In the original story and book, Barney's probing wasn't really mentioned or focused on. It wasn't until later that the detail was included upon review of the audio tape. So back in the 1960s, they didn't even discuss the anal probing part. They're like, whoa, 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 we can't print that. That's too far. I don't th I'm not sure if they included the genital wart thing or not, but yeah. it'd be weird if they included one, but not the other. It doesn't seem like probing was really entrenched in abduction lore until the late 1980s. This decade's public culture was much less sexually stifled than the early 60s, partially due to the countercultures of the late 60s and early 70s. Buttholes were certainly on the mind of the public in the 80s due to heavy media coverage of two key events, Ronald Reagan's colon cancer and the AIDS epidemic. When were you born? 83. Okay, so you, you probably won't have any memory no. of this. Okay, okay, just wondering, just wondering. Reagan underwent a colonoscopy and colonectomy to remove polyps in 1985. Gross. And underwent a follow-up in 1987, which was also widely publicized. It was around this time that the AIDS epidemic swept the nation. The primary infection spread method of HIV AIDS was and still is male-to-male -male sexual contact, 41% of infection cases according to the CDC. And so the public view of this disease was inevitably linked with anal sex. Hmm. So we're getting real deep here. Real so deep. It's we're basically gonna... saying you can't get it from women. No, you, you can. There's a variety where you can get it through, uh, you know, male to male sex. You can get it from uh, vaginal sex with a female. You can get it from used needles. Right. You can get it from blood. But the primary infection rate is from male to male. Is from male to male sex. I got you. In 1987, horror author and alien abductee Whitley Stryber published his hit work, Communion, a true story, which recounts his alleged alien abduction experience in which he focuses heavily on the anal probing section of the medical procedure in which he equates the procedure with rape. They inserted this thing into my rectum. It seemed to swarm into me as if it, it had a life of its own. Apparently, the purpose was to take samples, possibly a fecal matter. But at the time, I had the impression I was being raped. And for the first time... I felt anger. Yeah, so definitely traumatizing. Definitely, I could see why they wouldn't include this in the 19th. It just makes people uncomfortable and understandably, as it should, as it definitely should. But yeah, so. Seemed to me that they were pretty professional. Yeah, I mean, they were professional, but it's funny. not definitely not a pleasant experience right. at all. And especially at the time when you have no idea what's happening. I had, I had to go to the doctor once and have my. Uh, Anus probed? 
Yeah, with his fingers. Yeah. How'd that go? Yeah, well, it it went fine. I mean, it was over quickly, but it was with big old sausage fingers. <laughs> and then he throws Kleenex at you afterwards and says, like, clean yourself up. <laughs> You whore. <laughs> you filthy whore. I can't believe you let me do that to you. That'll be 150 bucks. I'll bill the rest of your insurance. I'm not joking either. That's really yeah. Like, I'm clean yourself up. I'm like, what? Like, I guess. I mean, you got to check out there sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean. It's, like medically, men do need to have their prostate checked. So. Well, it was funny that they, they give you the Kleenex, not for the. I mean, I guess it's partly for the lube. Right. Or whatever. That they, but they also, I guess some people. Uh, I guess the scientific word would be ejaculate. Oh no! Yeah, oh. Like, oh. I guess some well, men do that. I mean, I mean, if you hit the prostate just right, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's the male G spot. So. I know. Yeah, 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 but... <laughs> all right, all right yeah. we're we're gonna get back to yeah. this now. <laughs> Fun facts with Darren and Gary. So put simply, the reason why probing is such a huge part of the public perception of the alien abduction narrative is because one. It seems to be a common part of all these cases, and likely because communion was published during a time when America had anal acts, both medical and sexual, on the brain. So we're tying it back to the whole zeitgeist as a whole. Communion was published in the exact same year that Reagan had his follow-up colonoscopy or colonectomy, which was the most widely publicized as all of them. And this was right in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, so butthole in the brain, a new hit <laughs> alien abduction book comes out which includes that part heavily. And so that's why, that's most likely why, or I wouldn't even say most likely, but the theorize that that's why we, know, we think of adoption and we think anal probing. Immediately. It's crazy. I know, I know. It just immediately comes to mind. You can't help it. So big thanks to the surprisingly insightful and thorough Reddit user, Sun Against Gold, who was the actual person who made all these connections with Reagan and AIDS and communion. Uh, I didn't do any of that. I don't take credit for any of that work. I'm just sharing them here. So good job, guy. It was really, really thorough work. I mean, he could be totally wrong, but I definitely see it for sure. And as for why aliens do this, it is most likely to take fecal, fecal matter samples as proposed by both Barney Hill and Whitley Stryber. And that's it. Our first full alien episode with our three pages on anal probing. <laughs> um, let us know if you want us to do more on aliens in the future, because there's definitely plenty of content out there. Ancient UFO encounters, cattle mutilations, alien species. There are more than just the greys out there, supposedly. You name it. There's a book, so much. Definitely won't uh, hurt for content uh, when it comes to aliens. So, what'd you think? Uh, you know, this is one of them, like, because I'm not big into... It's weird. This is crazy. And this is this is kind of relevant. But I'm sure you've heard me in the past when we talked about Star Wars. You know, I've never seen Star Wars. I've never seen Star Wars. Right, or, right. Or, you know, my parents were Trekkies, but... I never liked the games. I never, I never liked games of space. I never yep. liked movies of space, mm. but like, like this, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I actually kind of want to go down this rabbit hole on YouTube. Yeah. Cause uh, it's so detailed. And cause and also just recently I started playing this game on Xbox or on the PC for Xbox, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, no man's sky. Oh yeah. It's yeah. A space game. Yep. Loving it. Yep. And I, Normally that stuff is just yeah. Actually, me neither. Like I, I'm obsessed with Star Wars, but that's not even really considered sci-fi. It's like space fantasy. Yeah, I don't know. And I that's just... pretty much like the only thing about it I like. So it's just really weird to me because I got into that game, and mm -hmm. then we did this, we did this episode, and now you're I'm, interested. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, yeah me so. too. Because I'm usually not interested in like alien and stuff, but I, I do think alien abductions are interesting um, because of the whole you know almost yeah almost saw like aspects that are portrayed in like bigger movies like fire in the sky or like communion um but this whole case to me was super interesting and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to do it because it's one of the first and i actually found it interesting a lot of the tropes that you hear in almost every alien abduction stories in this one so yeah yeah there's a lot of a lot of details a lot of little things that you wouldn't find in a typical ufo story because there's so much detail to it it's been investigated by so many people and everyone seems to come to the conclusion that they're not lying I was, or at least they don't think they're lying i was really surprised with the whole probing things i know then on the last episode we talked about how we were going to talk about probing mm -hmm. yep and definitely promised that i was really surprised that it was a lot less more rapey than I ever thought it was. You know right. I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, like because, it's it, like, I seriously feel like I'm like, oh, they was just doing an exam, like a doctor. Right. Cause you yep. know, 
growing up, you always oh yeah, and got pop culture especially. Yeah. Like I mentioned, in different shows like South Park, like you mentioned, it right. seems they make it very sexual. Yeah, and it's very and it seems almost very painful when in right. when in reality it's a very. I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure there are exceptions, but non painful, very medical professional so it's cool. procedure. I, yeah, it's like, yeah. I like, I like that. It's a, it's a, I, I really like the, the turn we went into almost like sociology and the, the public consciousness at the time and how it related to anal probing. I was like, I was never expecting that uh, when I started doing research. Because the, the was part, I was like, oh, well, I guess I got to do the anal probing part now. And then yeah. I came up with that. I was like, wow. Wow. Uh, this took up a good so part of the episode. Now, yeah. yeah, not so much. I mean, anything in the rectum is uncomfortable, but... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, unless you're into that. Yeah. Then more power to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> now for my bread and butter. If you like the show, please give us a rating on whatever app you use that will let you leave a review. Uh, give us five stars. Come on. Ten stars. No, better yet, give us a hundred stars. Ten million stars. Ten million stars. <laughs> mm. <laughs> whatever. However, you know, whatever. This is just... You know, the more the better. Yeah, highest amount of stars that let you leave yeah. it. And if, like I said, like I've told you in the past, if you leave us one or two, just just let us know why. Yeah. Even if it's bad, just let us know why. But yeah, so we, we, we would improve. Definitely improve. We would definitely prefer the five stars and you know, leave a comment about why you like the show. That's right. also nice to hear. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that too. If you leave mm -hmm. five star, please tell oh, us why. <laughs> speaking of our views, I, like I, I know. I know you get a little uh, defensive when it comes to negative reviews, but I recently discovered a YouTube a negative YouTube comment, which was happened like a year ago, which I never saw before. And I thought it was funny, but I, I'm, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to tell you because I know you kind of, you take this so hard a little bit. So, uh, but what it was, it was on the Bridgewater Triangle episode. I don't even know if you remember that episode. Uh, uh, and all the comments said was uh, f jerk offs. <laughs> That's all it said. That's all it was. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't start laughing. I, I almost commented back, but I was like, nah, yeah. not worth it. Not worth it. But I, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> see, I'll jerk you off. <laughs> wow. I didn't ever see that. I'm, I'm going to have to go look that I, up. I didn't see it either. It was weird because usually I get notifications about that. And by, I guess I just missed that one. He's entitled to his opinion. Absolutely. And he's not wrong. He's not wrong. He's absolutely <laughs> Uh, please follow us on all social media. Send us a message about anything. We'd love to hear from you guys. Anything. Course, Doesn't even have to be about the podcast. Yeah, just say hi. Uh, we're on Facebook and the Twitters, as well as the Gram, the Reddit, the YouTube, and even TikTok, which I still haven't done anything on. <laughs> wow, Gary. Yeah, I will. I, I will. I will. I you promise. have one job. Let me get a haircut. Let me get a haircut. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be about you, you narcissist. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you're right. Well, I mean, I, you know, people want to see. Yeah, my face. pretty much. Has, yeah, it's true. They you want. They want to see. They want to see the beautiful face. With yeah. This, with these. If you're wondering what our faces look like, you can just go to the TikTok, Perfect. and eventually Gary Vocal will post it there. I, was graced with. I mean, I still post clips of the episode there, so you can go there anytime. Check out our tiers on Patreon if you're interested in voting for future episodes and or the bonus content we have there. Uh, definitely going to be adding quite a bit there pretty soon, so hopefully you'll get your money's worth. I mean, it's more of a donation thing, but I like to I like to reward that donation with content. And as usual, if you have a topic suggestion, question, comment, criticism, leave it in a YouTube comment. Um, yeah. Or if you have a story you'd like us to share on our encounter series, please contact us on social media or email us at snipehuntpodcast at gmail.com. And if you do have something negative to say, I would rather you just leave it on some random YouTube video other than, <laughs> rather hey, than a review. And by the way, I'm pretty sure you got more offended by that one star review that one time than I did. I don't know. I don't know. It was our first one star, yeah, Gary. Right. Now yeah. I don't care. But it, hit then. <laughs> it hit us both. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and end on the final joke. You ready, Gary? Oh, sure. <laughs> so stupid. What, what do aliens keep their teacups on? Okay, so a coaster. Um, am I close? You're you're in the right. You're in the ballpark. <laughs> you don't have to figure it out. I have no idea. Flying saucers. Ah, <laughs> <there it> <laughs> <is>. <laughs> uh -huh. Thanks for listening. Yeah. So here we are again, looking up at the night sky. Once again, you are filled with a sense of awe. But another feeling creeps in as well. Fear? The possibility of life on other planets is exciting, but it is, in equal parts, terrifying. Who knows how these extraterrestrials view humanity? Hopefully more than just 
test subjects. Keep an eye on the sky and watch out for flying discs full of frightening folklore. Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under fair use. The music you have heard in this episode was composed by Mayu, Nature World 1986, and Festlian Studios. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and hopefully see you on the next hunt. Yay. Dude, I am so j-